kind of NDA thing because I don't plan on editing this. So, right. hey, here we go. Welcome, viewers. Uh, John Reed and late night Dick Hirsch. Oh yeah. Across the globe. What's going on, man? Not much. Friday night. Nothing better to like to do than yeah. talk about cloud. Just off a of customer escalation. So. Yeah. You're living the Always life, good. man. You're living yeah, the dream. Yeah, you know it. You know it. So, uh, so Dick and I were amongst the attendees of the Sapphire Asa conference in Orlando a few weeks ago, and it was a fairly significant show for a variety of reasons, including the uh, abrupt departure of Vishal Sikha not too long before the show. And you and I, right before you headed out on the plane, we had a hotel lobby conversation. It was one of those conversations where everything started to make sense and was interesting. And uh, I don't know if we can... <laughs> we'll probably screw it up if we try to recapture that in this, but a number of things have even happened since then. So what we're going to try to do is just not really review Sapphire from like a, you know, oh, I thought this keynote was great or this one sucked kind of thing, but just look at it more from a, a question of what we did learn. Because um, right. I think we did learn some things once you put all the pieces together. Um, but we learned a lot of stuff that wasn't on the keynotes, so we're going to dig around behind the keynotes to some of our meetings and then kind of look ahead to what's next. So I don't know. What, what's on the top of your mind at the moment? Well, I mean, the thing that I thought was interesting was the HANA Enterprise Cloud is coming into its own. Um, I knew that it was important before the event, and I blogged about it actually on the day of the first keynote, and if you take a look at sort of where they're going and where they're pushing and Simple Finance came out with a real um, burst of energy, it's an important application and it will be running first and foremost on the HANA Enterprise Cloud um, along with a variety of other applications which are already present on that, that platform. And that for me um, is a sign that they are very interested in moving existing customers um, into the cloud. That's the push. Um, that's the main focus right now. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if you were struck by that, but I just noticed from compared to past events that HANA Enterprise Cloud got a whole lot of emphasis, uh, much more so than, say, the HANA Cloud platform, though that also got some attention. Um, but it was, clear right. what the, it was clear what the point of emphasis was, and I think you're right in terms of be, because you can debate whether the HANA Enterprise Cloud is a true cloud in the in the purity right. sense. Right, that's that's a whole that's a whole nother yeah. story. Yeah, and and of course, you know, I definitely saw some cynical tweets kind of lambasting it as a hosted solution or what have you. Right. But, but the point is, it does offer a, an immediate, um, you know, option that SAP can say to its customers as far as yeah, you can you can put this your application in the cloud per se. Uh, but just for people who haven't been watching this as closely, when you think about the HANA Enterprise Cloud versus the HANA Cloud platform, do you think you have a pretty good understanding of how SAP is perceiving the two? How would you describe the two? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, basically, the HANA Cloud platform is the extension platform, okay? Right. Um, and that is basically where they would like to push um, some degree of innovation from customers um, because what we have to remember is that SAP's and Enterprise Cloud is a managed cloud environment which, which means that SAP is very interested in standardization. They don't want 70 different customers having these crazy environments. Ideally they would have customers with very similar environments um, just because for them it's much more efficient. Um, but, of course, if you are a customer, you want to have your differentiating processes. How does that work? Um, and so the one thing that I'm always curious in is to figure out how much of this innovation takes place on the HANA Enterprise Cloud and how much of it would they push off into other areas, such as the HANA Cloud platform. So that, for me, is sort of this difference be, be, between the two environments. Right. And, and I think SAP is getting a little better, at least, at, at explaining clearly what those differences are. Um, it's not always 100% clear, but I do see your point. And, and, and to that effect, we, we, got, we did get some reassurances at Sapphire from several executives that 
SAP is continuing the process of moving all of its cloud applications to the HANA cloud platform in a sense. That it, by in a sense, I mean that they don't necessarily care whether the applications themselves are running on it. What they care about is what you said, which is that partners and customers can and developers, hopefully in the future, can build extensions to those apps right. on that on that same platform, right? Because it right. doesn't make it doesn't make any sense for partners to be building add-ons to you know Ariba or Success Factors or some of SAP's CRM apps or whatever on different platforms using different uh, coding languages or whatever. So the idea is it all goes on these platforms and and Success Factors actually, as you probably noticed as well, is sort of leading the way in terms of right. ex extending existing SaaS applications. So. I give the success factors team some credit for that because when I first talked with them about it, they were like platform. I don't really care about that. Right. Um, but now they're actually a little further along, um, right. and it's it's a combination of using core kind of pass capabilities, but also uh, uh, connectors to these applications. And I'm forgetting what the success factors ones are called. You might remember, um, mm -hmm. but. I mean, but for me, one of the most important um, events or p the um, sessions at the Sapphire was when Steve Lucas gave a session on the HANA Cloud Platform. And that for me, I mean, I didn't learn anything new, but what was critical was that the level of support was at that high of a management level, which I had never seen before. Right. Um, and that was another sign that they are becoming aware of its importance which I, in the past, have sort of regarded as not always um, optimal in terms of the level of resources. But right now, if Steve Lucas, with his um, salesmanship, has the ability to really start pushing the platform, I think it has great potential. Um, and I want to look a little bit beyond the Sapphire. And there was an important speech which was given at the Cloud Foundry Summit, um, I think two weeks ago, where Dirk Basanak from SAP and also other individuals from Hybris um, were at this conference and talked about their um, use of or their interest in Cloud Foundry as a foundation or as a, as a possible foundation for the HANA Cloud Platform. And this for me is a, a critical step um, because once again they're moving away from doing everything themselves and Cloud Foundry would provide um, SAP another um, level or another part of the architecture which is based on a um, open source project or product actually um, and just give them a lot more efficiency in terms of where they're going with the, the HANA Cloud platform. Right and in, in theory you're going to get a much more robust platform if you don't try to reinvent the wheel of what open okay. source are already doing and for those who may not have followed it as closely Cloud Foundry's version of, of PaaS has really become the most widely right. adopted on the open source side, so it is something to watch. Right. I mean, and it's. I mean, what was interesting was looking at Cloud Foundry and watching it as it expands. Right now, it's part of um, IBM's Bluemix. It's part of the the PaaS from HP, um, and as it sort of gets, as it reaches a, a, a critical mass the functionality which goes into it will keep increasing and the the other companies which use this will of course be able to to depend on it much more in terms of just getting the stuff out the door um, because they don't have to do everything themselves they can use Cloud Foundry and just um, move much more rapidly which is what I think SAP wants to do right and, and do you think that that also it, there's a rapid movement part but isn't there also uh, a developer engagement part that that also helps us yeah, with outside Good developers point. who are going to be a lot more interested in, in 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 building on a cloud foundry than they are in learning about SAP's proprietary platform, right? Right. I mean, and and if you take a look at that, I mean, cloud foundry has a certain set of de deployment tools, a certain then API, okay. And if you learn that, then it doesn't matter. Um, if you're on Bluemix, whether you're on the HANA Cloud Platform, whether you're on someplace else, it's all the same. Right. Which means it's just a higher level of efficiency. And if you're interested in moving from one to the other, it's it's much easier. Of course, once that happens, then as a 
company using or then providing a Cloud Foundry based pass, then how do you differentiate yourself? Because you have this common layer which is uh, across many different passes. What do you do to sort of um, say I'm better? And SAP has some, it has a, has a uh, treasure chest. What it has is basically this deep business knowledge which has had for years and years and years. The question is how do you move this knowledge, how do you move this process knowledge into the new world of um, a pause, okay? And there what's interesting is looking and seeing how Hybris is uh, working. Hybris is much more on the, the cutting edge right now in terms of moving closer to what Cloud Foundry is um, evolving towards. But I mean, Hybris is part of um, SAP as well, and we'll see what sort of synergies sort of evolve there. We could probably talk the whole uh, discussion around this, around the emerging platform, but I want to hit on a few other things. Maybe we'll circle back. Uh, uh -huh. there, we also learned some things about simple finance. Which right, was, that was in the next point. Yeah, go ahead. Which was really at the heart of Hasso's um, second day keynote when he wasn't debating disruption with with Clayton Christensen. Yep. Uh, his real emphasis was on simple finance, or uh, which uh, had been under development for some time as smart financials. But basically, uh, for those who weren't following it closely, it's essentially kind of a radical rewrite of of SAP's financial functionality with um, in-memory innovation and HANA firmly right. in mind in terms of a lot of simplification. Uh, aggregates are the new dirty word, right? Uh, right. But, but it's also providing SAP an opportunity to rethink from a process angle um, sort, of, uh, sort of what you might call tired accounting principles and uh, in theory offering you know, a much better overall um, experience and of course combined with some of SAP's UI innovations in theory right. this is a uh, kind of a next generation application uh, and what we have learned is that it's going to be available from what we can tell both cloud and on-premise uh, the the and, uh, no. and, and it's and in conjunction with the rest of the business suite right it's it gets a little confusing some of the distinctions uh, but there's also a, a new angle which was um, there was a I just blogged about this the other day there was a session which uh, Sven Denikin did I think in Australia and there's one slide which is very interesting because it shows simple finance on the public cloud as well right okay which means that basically you have one code base for public private yes. and on-premise okay right. and some people are gonna scream up and down but it's not true cloud it's not true cloud okay that that might be an issue that you'd have to examine with multi-tenancy talk to Hasso he has a very strong opinion on that Yep. Um, but I think it's fascinating to sort of look at that model and then see, because yep. everyone's seeing that simple finance is the first of many, okay, simple applications, okay, and yep. that for me is a very interesting idea where you basically have one code base for any any environment, um, and then you start looking at SAP's solutions and saying, okay, what can this sort of simple, simplified model replace? You go down, you go maybe the SME. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, this is all, I mean, it could affect a lot of these various um, solutions which already exist, which haven't been simplified. Um, and if you're a partner, I mean, it's an interesting idea because then you basically have one code base where you develop to um, that runs on all, on all platforms. Which is pretty amazing thought. Yeah, I mean, you probably noticed that SAP got a lot of criticism about this notion of simplification because when you really take that model to the extreme, you're looking at everything from implementation services to uh, post implementation support to patches to the to the bloated services ecosystem around these products, and so simple is not going to be easy for SAP, but I really was struck by what you're pointing out, which is this idea of not only simplifying the business suite code base in a sense, but really standardizing SAP products right. on on one code base. And like you said, it may create debates around, you know, is this really the optimal cloud architecture? But those are going to be right. very interesting trade-offs. And 
uh, I would just say that SAP's got pretty strong opinions about this because they they do have a multi-tenant product called Business by Design that is right. technically still around that um, right. has not actually been a super successful product, I think would be a fair uh, understatement, um, but is a multi-tenant right. product, and so that's been very sort of educational for SAP development as far as what are the pros and cons of that. And and so th it's clear, clear to me that SAP is building their next generation applications with HANA as the backbone, and the okay. cloud versus on-premise part is not really the key consideration, but they are making sure that these new apps can run in both environments. And, right. you know, I hate to say this, but that part of it reminds me a lot of Oracle Fusion. <laughs> uh, that's right. not unlike what Oracle's done with Fusion. Right. Um, Which is, I mean, perhaps one one, um, one one issue, but, I mean, you have to remember as well that they're going for, for a public cloud. So, yeah. I mean... Right. And one of the other changes, I think, it, I don't know what the announcement was before or after the Sapphire, was that SAP is now supporting certain applications on Azure. Right. Um, so that is the idea that really they have much broader desire to go into all these different clouds, not just on-premise, not just the, the HANA Enterprise Cloud. And what's also interesting is that everyone says HANA Enterprise Cloud is SAP. That's wrong. It's SAP, but it's also any part or... Well, Certified partners can also support HANA Enterprise Cloud solutions. Okay, so the idea is basically that they want to broaden the the number of customers who are using their software in a, in a in a cloud environment. And doesn't matter whether it's a partner based cloud or an SAP based cloud, public private. Um, that's all more or less in the sort of where they're, where they're heading it. And I mean, I think SAP is also very aware, and they always say this, that it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid environment that they're, that they're talking about here. And hybrid for SAP is, right. um, it's not public cloud, private cloud. For SAP, it's usually um, hybrid refers to an on-premise and a cloud environment. Um, and this is, I mean, realistic, because people aren't going to move everything to the cloud immediately. Right. Um, and so they're just taking certain applications, moving them into the cloud, um, and providing cu customers the ability to really um, sort of do best of breed with on-premise stuff and um, cloud-based stuff. And what's interesting right. is that now you're finally starting to see a push in HANA cloud integration, which I've been waiting for for, for years. And it's now really starting to be pushed. And in fact, there was a session in Holland today. There was a, the first CoJam, which was um, specifically directed to or towards um, the HANA Cloud integration offering. Mm -hmm. So previously, it was always HANA. Everything was HANA-based to HANA Developer Studio. But right now, they're moving beyond that. Um, and so that's good. I mean, because that's really, if I'm a customer and I have a hybrid environment, how do I move things from my on-premise world into the uh, SaaS environment? And that's where the HCI comes into place. Yeah, the interesting thing is that if if you made a list, you know, of the real cloud sort of purists who really believe in cloud, not just for um, uh, sort of IT simplification, but just a better a business transformation, right? Like the new SAP approach seems to capture more. It may not satisfy all the architectural tenets of multi-tenancy. Mm -hmm. We could debate that, but there are more things on the list, right? Because now you're you are not just throwing applications up in the cloud, but you're rethinking processes. You're reimagining right. them, and with HTML5 Fiori type movement on the UI side. You're also trying to rethink the user experience as well, um, right. and so you are heading a little closer, I think, to what cloud purists would want to see. But I think we get back to customers and needing to let customers make some of these decisions with their wallets. Um, right. Our colleague Graham Robinson, while we're on this subject, he wrote a blog about this, pointing out that the current name of the on-premise version of this simple finance is called. Financials add-on for SAP Business Suite powered by SAP HANA, um, which is probably not the ideal name. Um, he went on to uh, make the case that SAP is currently planning to charge a small license fee 
to existing customers for this update. Um, so, and he, uh, of course, is not terribly impressed by that. Um, right. So that's another interesting aspect to this whole thing is as SAP starts to deliver these rethought approaches, what will existing customers uh, sort of have to pay for and what will they be grandfathered in? Um, that's right. going to be an interesting aspect of all this. Right. Well, I mean, I think we have to remember as well that SAP does provide customers the ability to use this stuff on a subscription basis. Yeah. Okay, so that's something that's people... That's part of the enterprise cloud approach, right? Yes. Yep. I mean, so it, it's more than just hosting. Right. Okay, and I think that that's... And I mean, once one of, one of the advantages that SAP has is that once um, customers have their, their solutions in the HANA enterprise cloud, then SAP has much more flexibility to make changes. Um, right. Of course, with customers' permission, but if they see there's something wrong or they, or they want to make a change, it's much easier if it's on their premise, um, in their environment, rather than a customer's environment. Yeah. So another piece that uh, that I don't think got a lot of attention, but there's there's been discussions for many years now as to whether SAP would actually try to uh, try to essentially write uh, a new version of the business suite uh, for the cloud. Um, and essentially, that is sort of what they're doing. Though I would argue they're they're doing it for Hana, yes. and and that the, exactly. the cloud is more of a byproduct. I think you'd probably agree with that approach. Yes. But but basically, simple finance is just the beginning, and they are yes. gonna what we've been told, uh, and this includes like from people like Bernd Leichhardt and um, and Hasa Plotner who are in a position to know, uh, is that they are gonna you know basically approach the entire suite with this. Simplification, uh, you know, slash war on aggregates, uh, right. process rethink agenda, and of course that does get very interesting for a couple of reasons. One of the ways it's interesting is that SAP does have major acquisitions in some of these areas, like success factors. Right. So as SAP rewrites HCM, what does that mean for no. success factors functionality? Right, um, and I think True. we started to get some early indications on that. Right. Well, I mean, we also have to remember if you look at organizationally, SAP, where SAP is, is 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 going. I mean, you already see, like for HCM and for other groups, that the on-premise and the cloud groups are, are coming much closer together. Right. And I think that's that's the way to go because I mean, what's what's important is not um, where it's deployed, but sort of the information and sort of the domain knowledge which is behind it. And I mean, for me. And I think this is true for, for SAP as well. Cloud on premise, um, public cloud, private cloud, they're just deployment options. Um, some cloud PRS might say, yeah, but 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 cloud is different. Yeah. Um, but I think the the more important thing is just getting sort of um, this domain knowledge out there. And if you bring both worlds together, like the, from success factors on the on premise HCM teams, I think they're much more. Um, powerful in terms of their synergies because they both have different experiences and they can work together. And I think that's, I mean, I, I don't think one's going to, see, I mean, I, I don't you can say success, fa success factors is, is, is going to disappear. I think both are going to come together and form something new. Right. And it might begin by some integration, further integration points between the two. And um, Right. So, but it is going to be an interesting story to watch because when you say you're going to rewrite the entire suite, in a sense, and and the thing is that before, the whole the reason I always said that would never happen is because I imagine it would be, given the amount of code, I can't remember how many code lines it is offhand. You probably it's like 400, 400 million or four hundred thousand. Yeah. I don't remember. It's, That's it's, some amazing it, amount. It's in the million, hundreds of millions. When you take that into account, you could never imagine me writing it. But essentially, what they said is that. Through this process of radical simplification, a lot of that code doesn't have to be rewritten. Um, right. They can essentially just leave it, and it goes away. Uh, right. And so that's opened up, I think, some renewed energy for tackling this issue of redoing the right. the suite. Um, it's right. just that it's just that it's not it's it's being done in a different way than people originally were thinking. What I think is going to be fascinating, though, is whether whether um, how it's eventually going to be packaged and presented, right? Because right. when you look at large enterprise cloud like SaaS applications, 
they're generally not purchased as a suite at this time, you know. Mm-hmm. And Bill, Bill McDermott has been very clear that he believes the suite always wins. Um, right. So it will be very interesting to see how, like, I think it does have some implications, right, because it has to do with how componentized and how sort of so-called loosely coupled these different pieces are. You know, can I just buy the HCM piece? Can I, you know, and can and can I have a... A, a CRM component from another vendor, and does it all get along uh, with the financials right. piece, um, or or is there gonna, you know, it's just a really interesting question. And then, of course, integration. It's not like uh, like you said, cloud integration is still something that is causing people a lot of consternation, and right. um, not not just SAP customers, but every every company that has multiple cloud solutions is sort of trying to figure out where yeah. they go with that. So anyway, I just think. That the whole thing about suite versus platform is still playing out um, because I don't. Th- I'm not sure if SAP knows ultimately what customers are going to want. Um, right. Maybe you do. Um, well, I mean, I don't. I mean, this is. I mean, I don't know every, every customer, but I'm sort of reminded of the the old idea of the honeycomb, which is like two or three years old. Which is the idea that you have um, you have different components which talk to one another and this is sort of the best of breed approach which was then sort of all the rage when financials on demand was coming out but they stopped that um, but I think for me it's interesting to view this as a as a partner okay um, when you move to simple finance can my developers still work with that can they use their app app skills still I mean, I think right. it's it's curious thinking about how will simple finance and how will the simple suite evolve. I think right now it's primarily still ABAP, but are we going to see a movement towards HANA XS, towards RDL, which no one sort of, I mean, RDL has sort of disappeared. That was, um, it's the it's a new development language, which is specifically for um, HANA, which was pushed very much by Vishal, and since Vishal left, it sort of gotten quiet around it. And that, for me, was always a very uh, critical component in sort of the rejuvenation of the suite in that you would be much more, um, much faster in terms of developing code via RDL, via um, HANA XS. And I don't know whether that's still the direction that they're, that they're going. Um, no one knows, um, which is sort of a, a sad statement, but that's when a very important leader in it for important leader slash innovator leaves, sometimes it's um, you got to wait a bit. For, yeah, for and, the I, dust and I think you're kind of setting the table for a central question that's going to be on the minds of developers and partners in the decode era in the fall, right? Which is how do I fit into this new SAP? Right. Um, and and there's a lot of different pieces to that because one of them is sort of from a strictly from a UI and UX standpoint, what do I need to know right. about about HTML5, about UI5, about Fiori? Uh, how do I need right. to incorporate that into what I'm doing? But but also as you point out, like how do I extend and customize applications? Because once you right. move once you once you move the business suite off premise and essentially SAP controls the environment and the updates, your configuration options just became you know, more limited again. I mean, obviously, SAP's got a lot of configurable functionality in the business suite, right. but it was not enough for a lot of customers, right? Who who had a bunch of custom code that eventually became right. a huge a huge technical impediment. Um, technical debt is the is the right. analyst for such predicaments. Um, so 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 the future of that is what you know for most companies, vanilla. Vanilla cloud solutions are not going to be the future. They're going to need right. customized, and so that's where this this platform really comes in. But as you point out, right. um, what what are my developers going to need to know? What what partners are right. building on that? How, what applications are available? Can I purchase them? Can I modify them? I don't know if you have a clear sense. I don't yet no, of how that's yet. all going to work. Not yet. I mean, and there's still to to SAP. That's not really a Sapphire question, but it's absolutely a decode question. Yeah, but it's. I mean, it's it's related because I mean, if you look at the idea of a marketplace, okay, I buy something as a business user, okay, right. Where do I deploy it? Can I deploy it? Um, questions like that. 
aren't, I mean, they're more than just developer yeah. um, oh, focused totally. questions. Um, and so that's, I mean, the, the story is getting clearer, but there's still pieces which aren't quite clear yet. Um, and I think that's one thing that I still have to work on. Um, because if you look at how other companies are moving in this area and they're, they're moving rapidly, look at, um, for example, Bluemix and people like that, they have a very um, intuitive way of, of, of adding content, adding um, you know, content to your um, development environment, for example. And right now that's still missing to a certain degree in terms of SAP's world. And I mean, how do you move that, that sort of metaphor to a business user? Um, because Bluemix right. is more focused on developer, SAP is more focused on, for example, a business user. What's the, what's the story there? And I think they still have some pieces to sort of um, figure out how, how, how everything fits together. Yeah, you make a good point because I've, I've been a little bit outspoken and, and grouchy about wanting to see more developer presence at Sapphire because, you know, I keep saying, well, everyone tells me it's about the apps, you know, well, who's right. going to build those apps, you know? Right. Developers are going to do that, and there does seem to still be kind of a bit of a chasm there um, that is going to need to be uh, dealt with and in order to make this something that we can talk in the same language, right, so that business users can right. understand why why platform matters and developers can understand, like, why why the heck business people are wanting to consume things in such sort of, you know, frictionless ways that are just kind of inconvenient for the classic, you know, right. developer who's just not used to... That That was never part of the specification, right? At least originally right. it wasn't. Um, and now it is. And, right. And, I mean, for me, like, I'm taking a step back and thinking of um, taking the role of a partner. Usually they have industry solutions, okay? And there was another announcement which was made during the Sapphire, right. but wasn't didn't get too much press. That was the idea of the industry cloud, um, which it, which, it, in my opinion, would be based at least in terms of its um, current sort of um, form as a HANA enterprise cloud based environment. Um, and I think they have to really get moving fast in this area because if you look at how their competitors are moving, for example, Salesforce just um, had an agreement with Philips regarding a new health. Um, platform um, with wearables, for example. Um, exciting stuff. Um, and I think SAP has the huge ecosystem, but they got to bring these people on board with their industry solutions. Um, I think that's, that's critical, and they should, because the, the suite is one thing, but you need the industry solutions as well to sort of broaden the base. Right. Um, and that is, if you look at the difference be, between non-differentiating processes and processes which are differentiating, usually you see the industry-related yeah. processes as being um, differentiating. And this was one point that Sevan Denikin had in his slides. Um, and that's where they have really have to, have to push. I think they're focusing on perhaps the core applications, moving them to the cloud, but you need both. Um, you need, right. if a customer has an innovative um, process, he wants to move this to the cloud as well, perhaps. How does that work? Um, yeah. And I think that's the area that they need to push. And these are partners which have to bring on board a lot faster. And I think that was one message that Steve Lucas was pushing was that we're open for business. Come. Partners should, should, should come. Um, and I'm waiting for the wave of partners to really make that move, which I haven't seen yet. Um, right. I went to an SAP partner event last August and I was struck by how many of the partners were really challenged by the way the marketplace is changing. It's not just SAP, it's how customers want to buy and consume software that's changing and right. um, you know a lot of traditional sort of partners are based around implementation services that are it's just not the full picture anymore and right. you know so, so you start to ac ask yourself are we going to be building solutions? Are we going to become partially a development shop? Um, right. And in which case, who do we need to hire? Uh, so, right. uh, you know, does our pricing model change? I mean, some of the ways of onboarding to get involved with uh, um, enterprise cloud um, services around the, I guess it's called, it was called MCAS, I'm not sure if it still is, but being able to offer managed cloud services 
some of the onboarding was was a little challenging. So it is going to be really interesting to see because it, this really is an ecosystem kind of play, right? It's it's not something right. SAP can just totally they can't just emerge from Waldorf in two years triumphantly with their new you know solution. Right, and I mean there was some critical press uh, I think like two days ago, um, sort of whining about SAP's sort of new vision that they're a cloud company and it, it's going to happen then overnight, um, and the people were saying it takes time and you can't just wake up and say I'm a professional um, soccer player. You have to work at it, um, and I think SAP just has to make make sure that they want to be a cloud company then they get it they have to pay their dues um, right. and they're doing it to a certain degree by acquisitions um, at the Sapphire we had a great conversation with the CEO um, from Field Glass and fascinating I mean an entirely different mindset um, and these are the people who sort of as um, Lars tried from success factors to sort of rejuvenate the company I think it's there um, but the question is What's what's going to happen? Is this sort of new culture that the acquisitions the acquisitions are bringing? Is it going to move throughout the whole corporation? Um, and that's not easy easy to determine at this time. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see if if SAP customers and users are active. I mean, one one thing that was different about this year's show is the Fiori and Personas announcement, which was essentially right. the that this now free with, you know, with for existing licenses, and this was an issue that the user groups had really been advocating, as well as um, all kinds of analysts and bloggers of all stripes, mentors, people like you and me, um, right. very, making our different cases for different approaches to it, but basically hitting SAP with pretty similar messages, and and the user groups were really active in that, ASUG and DSAG right. and and the UK user group as well. There may have been others. Um, and so that's a whole interesting question too: is what what are the user groups going to be sort of advocating for going forward? And in ASUG's case, ASUG's under new leadership now. Will they continue to be right. more vocal uh, like the around generation. their expectations? Um, right. So so how will that impact what SAP is trying to do as well? Because they definitely have user groups definitely have an ability to really have an impact on that and if, if they feel right. like SAP is straying too far in a in a direction that doesn't make sense then then they may may hear about it. So I'm I'm looking forward to hopefully hearing more vocal user group uh, communications um, because that would make a much more interesting direction for SAP if, if it's really having that public dialogue with the users. Yeah, but I mean what, what would you expect them to say? Either you're going too fast towards the cloud, um, yeah. Or you're going too slow, uh, or we all want to push everything to the public cloud instead of to the HANA Enterprise cloud. Um, those are questions. I mean, or the or the questions not dealing with cloud at all, but more going towards HANA. I mean, that's that's the other thing. It's really interesting, and I don't. I I haven't. You know, I I, I did. T I met with some ASUG leadership at at Orlando, and they I think they were still sort of looking at where they might. Sort of advocate for next, having you know, understandably, sort of relaxing into <laughs> a moment of accomplishment with the with the UI conversation. And I don't know exactly what's next, but I would hazard a guess that this whole issue of the casual user is going to be right near the top because once you start thinking about mobile users and uh, and cloud-based users, and you start thinking about opening up systems to customers, especially if you're in the retail or B2C right. space, where you start thinking about millions of people accessing your applications, right. um, you're probably going to need really different pricing models, and you're going to need different ways of looking at charging for usage and what that actually means. Uh, and and then there's contradictions are... Uh, our colleague Jarrett Pazahanik has been stumping for a long time now on differences in mobile uh, sort of functional pricing between on-premise and cloud HCM, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're really a cloud company, there should be no distinctions there. And 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 a typical cloud provider, they don't charge extra for mobile functionality 
that is right. essentially the the equivalent of what you could do on your desktop or if it's being extended via an app they're usually not charging for that um, right. so so anyway I, I think to me those are going to be issues the user groups are going to look really hard at because how can how can SAP guide users into a into that connected sort of enterprise that we hear about that networked enterprise if if we're tied to the professional user type license models so I think that's going right. to be a real interesting one to watch yeah but I think I mean I think Dennis was he said this like he's been saying it for a number of years that what you need are these 99 cent mobile apps from in enterprises yeah um, for, the, for the enterprise user I think that would be amazing I mean I was I was I was thinking what would be cool would be to have 99 cent app mobile app with in-app purchases I mean, I think right. that'd be an amazing idea. I mean, and that's, I mean, you got to rethink the, the model in terms of mobile. Um, and I think those would be sort of innovative ideas that they should look at. And I mean, I think Jared's right. I mean, I, I don't know that I want to give everything away free because if, 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 I'm, a, sure. if I'm a partner, um, if SAP gives away their apps for, for free and I have my apps, I mean, I don't want to give my apps away free and I need to earn my money somehow. Well, and, and and to be fair, I don't think the typical customers, at least the ones I talk to, I don't think they necessarily expect everything to be free either. But I do think they expect consistency across right. across platforms and means of consumption. And I think they're looking right. for they're looking for a fair balance, right? Because especially longtime customers that have been paying maintenance for a long time, they. Right they're not necessarily going to want to pay for every new innovation because they're going to feel like, well, I already purchased this past thing, and when I purchased that, you said it was state-of-the-art, <laughs> and, right. now, and now it's not. So I, I think there's just got to be a balance there, but I'm not, someone who, right. I'm not someone who insists that everything should be free, but I do think that, that, that I do think the enterprise is changing a lot in terms of the, a lot of things that used to be considered revenue generators really should be given away in order to encourage adoption and goodwill because they're not right. the core of how a company makes money. Um, I mean, right. look, you, you look at SAP Education, for example, which currently charges for a lot of different kinds of training and, and um, additional documentation that is sort of built for the purposes of educating users, but then SAP's got uh, free, free MOOCs running all the time um, right. and all kinds of free instruction and so I think this question, I'm not saying that SAP education has to give everything away starting tomorrow, I don't think they would be very happy with that message but I do think it raises really interesting questions around what do you uh, give away to to build goodwill and and you think of it in terms mm -hmm. of software too like you look at companies like MongoDB where they have 50,000 50, database downloads and they're punching above their weight because of the amount of adoption they have Right. By, by essentially making things so easy to download um, and, and SAP while it's made real strides I think we could say in developer engagement in the last couple of years um, and a lot of good cloud-based trials as well there's still when you try to download and make things happen it, you can still run into a lot of issues I mean Martin English just did a multi-series right. blog about that right. and three it, blogs, three huge blogs and it was, I thought, I don't know what you thought about that, but I thought it was a little, like, I mean, I I, th I think Martin ended on a constructive note, but I thought, I was thinking about it from the vantage point of someone who doesn't know SAP very well, and I was like, that would be a little tough for me to have to go through all those steps, you know? Right. So. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's also, I mean, you can't really, in terms of the, the number of solutions, you can't really compare SAP and MongoDB. Totally. Totally. I, mean, I just I think, think I just think I just think these upstart vendors are are changing things in terms of expectations. Like, yeah, and and then you have to reckon with that, and and the right. upstarts the upstarts are getting disrupted as well. By the way, because you know you move to subscription pricing, but the logical endpoint is sort of I think on demand elastic pricing, where you're not locked into right. a multi year subscription either. You know, so even right. the so called disruptors are sort of disrupting themselves. Right. Because the long-term implications of their model are are beyond even what they're doing. Um, right. So so yeah, I'm not necessarily saying that SAP is the same in the same situation, but I think I think it's things that are going to have to be looked at because it has to do with how do you 
build this 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 ecosystem around your product where you have you know thousands of applications being built by partners. Right. Uh, Are they ready for it? But you see. You see some good signs. Like, did you read that Tammy Paulus set up a business suite? I saw that. That was awesome. She set up like a, a what was it? A business suite um, trial uh, in the cloud, Hana, in, right. in like two hour Hana on two hours in the cloud. Right in the Amazon cloud, yeah. You can't, right? you can't code worth a lick from what she says. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, that, Tammy. I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm sure you're a better coder <laughs> than I am. But uh, but anyway, that's kind of interesting, right? I mean. Yeah, but I mean so, that's I mean. The one thing, I mean, we're talking about SAP dealing with new subscription models, but think of all the partners and their solutions. Are they ready to deal with that? I mean, for example, what I've seen, what I haven't seen anybody talk about is I'm a partner. I have my solution running on the business suite on HANA in the HANA Enterprise Cloud. That's on a subscription basis. Right. Does my solution have to be on a subscription basis as well? Am I able to deal with billing on a subscription basis? Yeah. Stuff like that. So I mean, there's just a whole, the the whole long tail in terms of effects when you start moving subscription. You have a large ecosystem. I think that's fascinating, um, yeah. just to figure out how these people are going to deal with that. Not just the cloud, but all the financial impl implications of moving to the cloud as well. Very good. All right. Well, let's move towards a towards a wrap. Uh, okay. Cool. Our, our listeners probably figured out that we didn't structure this at all. So. <laughs> This is very, very similar to what this is very, very similar to what what we would do at the end of our conference, and we were both kind of strung mm -hmm. out on caffeine. Yeah. Um, but uh, so so, what do you think in terms of? I'll ask you two final questions. One is, okay. uh, we're not quite at decode yet. We're like uh, a few months away yet. So, what do you think SAP could do to help themselves in the meantime, before we have these large scale events again? What what could they do in the next few months that would really advance the conversation in a good way for them? Hmm, that's a tough one. I think, I mean, for me, the one, the most important thing is have to move out of the existing SAP ecosystem in terms of the, the developers. Um, and I think the one thing they're doing now with all the code jams, um, but they should move into these other developer groups, open source groups like Cloud Foundry, that's why Cloud Foundry is so important, and involve, start that now. So that when the decode comes around, you can bring in to, to, to that large event these developer communi communities which you've already touched before and say, okay, we've had some interaction. Why don't you come to our event now um, and work with us here? Because SAP had, um, they were at the Cloud Foundry Summit. Why don't you bring the people from Cloud Foundry to decode, for example? That's how I would try and um, broaden the base for the upcoming decode. Mm -hmm. Now, those of you who those who follow your work are certainly aware that you're constantly churning over rocks that no one else would think of to find clues on what's next. Yeah. Um, you've been known to pour over everything from job postings to, oh, I don't know, uh, discarded memos. <laughs> no, the um, legal agreements, legal agreements. Yeah. Oh, right. Legal agreements. That's what we would call them. <laughs> so, so for you, is there is there a question that you would really like to get some validation on that is still lingering that you're looking into right now? Um, hmm, that that's a tough one. I mean, I'd like to have some clarification what they want to do with Cloud Foundry. To me, okay. as I, um, I, I have a general impression. Um, but I'd like them to come more or less go 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 public with, with what they're going to do, because that for me is the step to expand beyond the HANA cloud, the HANA enterprise cloud, because the HANA enterprise cloud for me is a is a transition point. It's not the end point. Okay, um, they have to move beyond that. And for me, the HANA cloud platform represents that's where the innovation is going to be. Um, because, like I said before, the the standardization stuff has to be on the HANA Enterprise Cloud, but the stuff with really innovative stuff, it has to be on the HCP. Um, and I want to see, for example, we haven't even talked about the um, Internet of Things, things like that. Cool things are coming out, um, and where is SAP going to handle stuff like this? Yeah. Um, it's not going to be on the HANA Enterprise Cloud. It's going to be on the HCP. And there is, right now, there is nothing out there that focuses everything on these traditional business applications. 
Okay? Yeah, they're rewriting the business suite into the simple suite. Cool. But what about all these other types of applications which are out there and which SAP is actually active? Connected car, they're doing stuff. Um, the smart meters, they're doing stuff. But the stuff doesn't get any attention. And I think that's what the want to show that the innovative ideas didn't sort of falter with the departure of Vishal. And that's something sort of, um, I just want to have um, a sort of um, comforting message that they're not going traditional applications, that there's still innovation going on. Right, right. Which was a theme that they hit on on the conference, but that was just the beginning of that, and, and the proof is in the follow-through, right? Right. Um, I agree. Because you have to publicly announce these partnerships and and then show real progress. Um, but it's right. a fast, it's a fascinating time when you have when you have big companies negotiating with open source groups and supporting them. And um, right. we'll see, we'll see where it leads. Right, and I mean, like I said, I always compare SAP and to other other competitors. And like I said in the um, earlier. You have Salesforce Philips doing an innovative health initiative. Right. Um, maybe that's just in my mind because it would just happened a few, few days ago. But I think SAP has to work in that area as well. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we addressed some of the questions. Then we probably that, that raised about twice as more. <laughs> of course, that's um, always. Yeah, I don't know that it matters. I think I just I wanted our listener to probably take a few things away that they didn't already know um, and then probably you have you guys listening probably have 10 or 20 more questions that we haven't even got to yet but right. unfortunately there's only so much sap you can do on a Friday night man exactly I'm disappointed your daughters didn't come in and interrupt us right maybe they're still at, 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 at their uh, party it's, it's only 11 o'clock they're probably still out and about ratings might have gone gone a little <laughs> bit higher and just watching two dudes um, talk <laughs> SAP, but anyway, sorry you guys didn't get to see Dick's daughters, but they're next just, time, next time they're not around right now, so there's nothing we can do about that at the moment. But anyway, thanks a lot for um, taking the time to share your latest ideas and research, Dick. Of course, look forward to. to the next one. Okay, right. yep, anytime. Take care. All right, no worries. We're still on the air at the moment until I cut it off. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, bye.